Welcome to the Georgia Archives May presentation educational series, fourth Friday from the archives. I'm Sigourney Smuts. I'm the conservator here at the Georgia Archives. Uh, we are glad that you have joined us for the presentation, Demystifying Conservation, Ethics and Methods Used in Caring for Georgia's Official Records by my colleague, Georgia Archives Assistant Conservator, Tracy Johnson. Uh, for those who are not able to attend the live presentation today, this will be posted to our YouTube channel next week. Tracy Johnson is the Assistant Conservator at the Georgia Archives in Morrow, where she has worked since 2014. She has over 18 years of experience in cultural heritage in institutions performing many roles and believes her love of crafting, engineering, preservation and history converged into her dream job here at the Archives. She holds a BA in English Literature with a minor in History from Middle Tennessee State University and a Master's in Library and Information Sciences from Kent State University. While focusing on knowledge organization systems and access to information during her, set, her studies, she discovered a passion for preserving archival documents, which eventually uh, introduced her to the magical discipline of conservation. Tracy will answer any questions you may have at the end of, your, of her presentation. I'm happy to welcome Assistant Conservator Tracy Johnson. Thank you. Welcome to the Conservation Lab, everybody. Let's start with an organic chemistry refresher. Just kidding. Seriously though, um, I want to explain broadly what conservation is and more specifically what the conservation staff does here at the Georgia Archives, all in a way that removes the intimidation that can sometimes be created when we conservators start taking ourselves too seriously. While conservation is a marriage of art and science, conservators are capable of speaking plainly about what we do and why it's important. That being said, let's jump into the discussion for today. So what do I mean when I refer to conservation and conservators? No, I'm not talking about plants and wildlife. Those would be conservationists. I'm talking about the means of preserving cultural heritage materials. This is a sampling of some of what we deal with day to day. Uh, but, but before we get too far into the weeds, let me backtrack a little by defining the term preservation. Preservation is the protection of cultural property through activities that minimize chemical and physical deterioration and damage, as well as prevent loss of informational content. The primary goal of preservation is to prolong the existence of cultural property. So preservation activities are generally done in institutions like museums, galleries, libraries, and archives, but you at home might be preserving your own collections. And the preservation activity you may be most familiar with and have considered for yourself is restoration. Restoration involves treatments intended to return cultural property to a known or assumed state, often through the addition of non-original material. The best way to explain this is to look at some examples. A bit of a disclaimer here is that these are not our items, and you'll understand soon why it's important for me to say that. Let me get my laser pointer here. This example on the left is a photograph that had become adhered to the glass in its frame, and there was some resulting damage when the two were separated. Through the use of image manipulation software, this restorer was able to fill in the missing details of this young man's face. In this example on the right of a physical restoration, this volume has been completely overhauled, so much so that the cover looks nothing like it originally did. The new spine doesn't even include the information from the original. The end result for each looks amazing, but there are some ethical issues involved with adding missing information. Like, how do we know that's exactly what this guy looked like? He could have had a mole right here. We don't know. Equally as troublesome could be omitting original information. Both results have greater implications when thinking about collection items that are used for content in research and items representing history accurately. Treatments like this dominated the field until an international shift in thinking about collections holistically and sustainably began in the 20th century. These new ways of thinking really took off after one major event that happened in November 1966. And that was the Arno River flood. In less than two days, 101 people were killed and Florence was destroyed. You can see in both these images how high and violent the rushing waters were that swept through the city, consequently causing damage to millions of rare materials in local libraries, museums, and archives. Professionals and volunteers who were called mud angels 
descended upon the city to help with cleanup efforts, and it was quickly realized by those in charge of the recovery that a new method of thinking about the collection's care was necessary to handle the scope and severity of the situation. This new method focused on stabilizing, then prioritizing items based on historic or cu cultural value before interventive treatment was performed. This meant a better allocation of resources, including time, labor, and materials. Furthermore, greater emphasis was placed on how to mitigate damage to collections, and this eventually became known as preventive conservation. The full definition of preventive conservation, also known as preventive care, is the mitigation of deterioration and damage to cultural property through the formulation and implementation of policies and procedures. These activities, such as environmental control and emergency preparedness and response training, are intended to provide the greatest long-term benefits to the largest number of collection items. So one of the ways that we here in the conservation lab like to explain this concept is to compare it to healthcare. So if you go to the doctor every year for your checkup and generally take care of yourself, you likely won't have any issues or can at least catch problems early. However, if you neglect going to a doctor for 10 years or so, you might discover you have some health issue that could have been prevented. And applying this concept to collections, preventive care activities help to prevent the need for more costly and invasive treatments by controlling the environment in which the, the items are stored and how they are handled. The other methodology shift that began developing after the Arno flood involved understanding the materials and production methods that make up an original item and working with those things to stabilize or conserve what is left of the original. To go back to the healthcare analogy, conservation is more like fixing a broken bone so it will heal and return the owner to as close as normal operating condition as possible. On the other hand, restoration is more like plastic surgery to alter the owner's appearance in some way, either in an attempt to look younger or enhanced. So while fixing a broken bone is necessary to restore quality of life, a facelift is not. Let's get into conservation a little more. By definition, conservation, also known as interventive conservation, is the preservation of cultural property for the future through stabilization. Conservation activities include examination, documentation, treatment, and preventive care supported by research and education. So the main idea behind conservation is stabilizing what remains of an item without adding anything that would unnecessarily jeopardize the integrity of the original. Materials and methods used in treatment are tested by leaders in the field, meaning that when approved, these things are not known to have ill long-term effects on collection items or otherwise promote the degradation of treated items. So let me show you an example to further, further illustrate this point. If you saw Sigourney's talk last year on treating the 1893 Fulton County map, this will look familiar to you. If you haven't seen it, it's on our YouTube channel, and I highly recommend you check it out. In the meantime, I'll briefly describe what we did. This 10 foot by four foot map was made up of six smaller sections adhered together at their edges. The paper was poor quality wood pulp paper that had become acidic and brittle over time, and the whole thing was lined with fabric. The combination of these issues, along with the fact that the map had come to us and been stored rolled for so long, caused these distortions right around here and missing areas up here. To stabilize the item, the six individual pieces were gently separated to make treatment more manageable, and each piece was surface cleaned and washed to remove the acids in the paper and impart an alkaline buffer to mitigate against future acidity. They were also lined with Japanese tissue paper using a water-soluble adhesive, these being materials and methods that were adapted from Asian conservation techniques and proven to remain stable over thousands of years. Since the lining was removed and we used a lighter color tissue paper, you can really see in the after treatment where the missing areas are. So as I said, conservation is about stabilizing an item, not restoring it to a previous state or improving it aesthetically. Although items do usually be look better as a result of the stabilization, um, stabilization, excuse me. Um, had we wanted to restore this map, we might have attempted to fill in the missing areas, including any information lost to make this map look brand new. However, that is against the ethics of conservation and not in line with our mission here at the Georgia Archives. These ethics and guidelines are in part what differentiates conservators from restorers. This list specifically comes from the American Institute for Conservation, but there are many professional conservation groups that have similar guidelines. 
Although the guidelines are much longer than this, the main points I want to highlight are to respect cultural property, its significance, and those who created it. So that means we aren't to treat one item differently from another, even if we don't agree with the meaning it has. I have a colleague at another institution who has spoken about washing a Ku Klux Klan robe and dealing with the difficult emotions that resulted. Ultimately, we are to remain neutral so all voices are heard and history represented fully. Second point is to practice within the limits of personal competence to prevent damage to works. So we are to know our own limits, both emotionally and physically. If my colleague had felt she couldn't work on the KKK robe because of her emotions, the ethical thing to do would have been to ask another conservator to take over. Similarly, if she had asked someone like me with no experience in textile conservation to take over, I would have had no business performing that treatment since my focus is on books, books and paper. The third point is to insist upon reversibility in case current treatments turn out to be undesirable or better treatment method is discovered in the future. In just a few slides, I'll go over preservation lamination and you'll see why re reversibility is so important to maintaining the stability of collection items. And then the last point I wanna bring up is to continue seeking education methods, uh, seeking education to stay current on best practice treatment methods. Uh, technology and materials are constantly evolving, and conservation borrows heavily from other disciplines like the medical field. Maybe today we're performing some treatment that is slightly invasive, but tomorrow there could be a breakthrough or discovery that allows us to do the same treatment with non-invasive methods. And what springs to mind is the discovery last year that scientists could use a particle accelerator to read scrolls too fragile to be unrolled. In contrast to this, Restoration does not have strict guidelines, such, excuse me, such strict guidelines, and therefore isn't appropriate for most cultural heritage institutions. The terms conservation and restoration are often used interchangeably, but there are distinct differences which this infographic helps to illustrate. Taking the same bike and putting it through both methods, you can see how different the outcomes can be. The decision to choose one method over another depends on the item and the desired result of the treatment. The opinions of the owner of an item, whether that's a private owner or an institution, can have a huge impact on this end result. Generally, archives and libraries are more concerned with preser preserving the history of an item, while galleries, museums, and private collectors may wish to restore their pieces to the item's original state for display, which protects artists' intent. Sometimes there may be a compromise in how far treatment goes, such as when we here at the archives have exhibits. In these cases, no pun intended, we not only want to make sure items will remain stable while on display for three months, but that they look good while doing it. And even in these instances, we still use retreatable methods and conservation grade materials. Restoring an item may erase any historical evidence of its use and therefore the reason for its value or significance. But if the item is more demonstrative of a time period when it was used, the restoration might be ethical. Ultimately, the answer of when to employ restoration or conservation and to what extent usually comes to, it depends. Every situation is different and there must be many people involved in deciding the extent of a treatment. Conservators rely on their ethics to help make the best possible treatment decisions based on the item's history and the goals of the treatment. Now that you're armed with a fundamental understanding of conservation, let's get into what we specifically do here at the Georgia Archives. At the heart of it, the mission of the Georgia Archives is to identify, collect, manage, preserve, provide access to, and publicize, uh, publicize records and information to the people of Georgia. While this particular statement is fairly new, the Archives has always been committed to the preservation and access of the collections we house. In fact, the founding of the archives was fought for by Lucian Lamar Knight because he was witnessing firsthand how poorly our state's records were being treated without a formal collecting program. Once established in 1918, Knight became the first director of the archives and immediately hired a restorer to look after the assembling collection. Previously known as the Restoration Lab, the Conservation Lab changed its name in the 1970s to more closely reflect the conservation ideals that had begun to take root internationally. While some of our collection comes from manuscripts and personal records that have been donated to us, most of it comes directly from state agencies dating all the way back to the founding of the colony in 1732. 
totaling more than 90,000 cubic feet of records. And to give you an idea of how much that is, this is one cubic foot. That is enough to keep us busy for many lifetimes. The Preservation Department, which the Conservation Lab belongs to, supports the mission of the archives by preserving and creating access to these records through both preventive and interventive means. The work of the Georgia Archives has always been informed by best practice from across, across the preservation world. So at one time we were more, more focused on the restoration side of collections care, as were most other institutions at the time. The process the Restoration Lab primarily performed was a combination of deacidifying and laminating documents, an intensive and expensive method developed around 1940 by William J. Barrow of the Virginia State Library. Shortly thereafter, the Georgia Archives, along with many other state archives, purchased one of Mr. Barrow's laminating machines and began laminating the highest priority collections. Once the inherent acids of the paper were removed, the lamination process was intended to protect items from further environmental risks. Collection items were sandwiched between cellulose acetate film and laminating tissue and placed in the laminating machine, where high pressure and heat effectively sealed the documents. The main benefit of preservation lamination was that items could be handled more easily and would be stable for longer than without, without lamination. We have so many maps and documents, especially really fragile ones like these that were laminated and may not have survived otherwise. Looking at the items in the picture, these clearly had a long and troubled life. The paper became brittle due to the content of the paper itself, so someone at some point decided to apply tape to keep the bits together. When the adhesive from the tape began degrading, which is what these dark spots are, some lamination was strategically applied and these items have more or less survived since. Another huge benefit was that whole collections could be laminated quickly, much quicker than treating items individually for safe storage. Often whole laminated collections were sent off to a bindery to be bound together in one volume for easy retrieval. However, that would ultimately prove to be a pro pro excuse me, problematic treatment. At the time, there were already visible problems associated with the lamination process, sometimes due to varying skill with application. But many institutions, including the Georgia Archives, felt that the advantages far outweighed the disadvantages. The heat involved in the process, as well as the opacity of the tissue, sometimes distorted the information in media and made the documents difficult to read. What the restoration staff didn't know then, and what we do know now, is that cellulose acetate degrades over time and puts laminated documents at risk for damage. Sometimes the sealed edges detach, exposing the document, or the film warps while it is still adhered, not to mention vinegar syndrome resulting from the chemical breakdown of the cellulose acetate and what that does to the composition of the paper. Several of the following images are of some educational materials previous staff members made of the lamination process, and little did they know how educational they would turn out to be. The tissue used in laminating documents sometimes distorted any writing or markings, making them difficult to read. Here you can see that some of the text is darker, um, but there are other parts which are a little more faded. So imagine what this would look like on a document that already had faded ink. You'd bar barely be able to read it. Then when the acetate breaks down, uh, it turns into acetic acid which then causes the paper to bec become more brittle. And here you can see some cracks that happen as a result of this combined with the next issue. When the lamination begins degrading, it shrinks and causes cockling, sometimes leading to fractures in the paper. Here you can see how the lamination is shrinking around the edges and causing the inner area to bunch up. This is because the lamination is fighting with the shape of the paper. And unfortunately, it will eventually win because it's stronger. Sometimes the lamination wasn't done properly, or there's just something about the item that caused the lamination to come loose. In these cases, the items are left exposed and at risk for possibly snagging the lamination and damaging the item. This is the back of the map where the lamination was done only on the back. Not only did the lamination likely cause these fractures along here, some here and in the middle, um, but then it separated itself from the map, except for a few spots that had to be separated manually. 
Luckily, this map was in a large folder and not in a position to be snagged on anything. Unless the lamination has already failed and is pulling away from the item without much manual help, removing it is very difficult. During the process of lamination, an adhesive is essentially melted into the tissue and the item being laminated. Softening the adhes adhesive requires soaking the item in an unhealthy amount of acetone and carefully peeling back the released tissue. You can see here how the conservator is decked out with all the PPE, including a half mask respirator and thick chemical resistant gloves. Also notice how much acetone she has on standby. That is not cheap. Once the archives shifted its focus to conservation activities in the 70s, greater emphasis was placed on expanding the existing means of preventive collections care. Some of the activities we currently perform or have control over are digitization, collection housing and storage, environmental monitoring to control temperature and humidity in order to slow deterioration and mitigate against mold growth, integrated pest management to monitor for pests and take action if found, through means that are safe for the collection, exhibit preparation and installation, disaster planning to ensure the safety of staff, patrons, and the collection in the unfortunate event of a disaster, creation, implementation, and maintenance of preservation policies, collection assessment, that is systematically determining the, the needs of a collection to ensure appropriate storage and treatment. So if you've ever been in our uh, microfilm, the microfilm area of the reference library, you may have noticed a slight vinegar smell coming from the reels. We began a survey in 2019 to assess the condition of the microfilm and explore alternative storage methods to prolong, prolong their usefulness. We also do outreach, education, and overall advocacy of the profession. So that includes tours of the lab, speaking engagements with outside groups, workshops, and professional presentations, so things like this. And it doesn't happen very often, but we also assist with filming in the building to ensure appropriate use and care of the space um, and any collection items being used. The image here is from when Mysteries at the Museum filmed a segment on a particular document we have where Jimmy Carter told of his experience seeing a UFO while governor in 1969. Oop. Went a little too far. Um, and then lastly, continuing education and professional development. So not only to adhere to the AIC code of ethics, but because education is cool. The conservation lab is focused on preventive conservation because as I said earlier, it is the least amount of effort for the greatest amount of good. Not only is it more sustainable, but realistically, it's the only way the two of us conservators here have a chance of keeping this huge collection maintained. As a result, we must plan our resources and time wisely. Usually when lo lower priority items come to the lab, we will make custom enclosures to at least stabilize them until we have the time and resources to provide further treatment. But we spend more time with higher priority items as they may be requested more by researchers or need greater care. This item here is an example of a brittle book made up of poor quality wood pulp paper, which will continue to do excuse me, to deteriorate over time. Because this item was not a priority, I create, created this custom enclosure so the item would be safe on the shelf until it's been designated a priority and moves on to its next phase of treatment. When it is necessary to perform interventive treatment, we do things quite differently than past lamination efforts. After the 70s, staff focused on cleaning, flattening and deacidifying, and mending collection items with water-soluble paste and Japanese tissue paper. In place of lamination, the archives began using a transparent material made of inert polyester to sleeve or encapsulate items from our collection. The sleeves that were then created using double-sided tape, uh, excuse me, the seams that were then created using double-sided tape are now created with the aid of an ultrasonic welder, which causes the polyester to melt together through, through vibrational energy instead of through heat. Such a sandwich of this material creates an electrostatic charge within and keeps items from slipping out. Excuse me. This item is badly damaged from the acidic effects of iron gall ink on this very thin tracing paper. You can see that it's eating right through the page. To stabilize it for storage, it was placed in a polyester sleeve, which is the shiny material. Um, <clears throat> to keep the fragile document intact, 
and with buff buffered paper to absorb some of the acids and prolong its life, which is this white that you're seeing. Regardless of the extent of treatment we perform, we use conservation grade materials that do not contribute to the deterioration of items. These materials are acid free, lignite free, and pH neutral. Oh no. <gasps> PowerPoint's not responding. What happened? It's, it's locked up. Is it locked up on there? Oh. We're having some technical difficulties. Just a second. There we go. All right, I'll get back to it. Let's see, where were we? We were here. Sorry, folks, let me just get back to my presenter view. Here we go. All right, <clears throat> so because we are an archive and much of our focus is on the what happened? Huh? Hit Windows. Hmm? No, no, start, start your PowerPoint. Hit Windows key. It's right here. You have to share it again. This? This. Yep. Now you're going to present it. Oh. Ah, you learn something new every day. <laughs> so, um, okay, because we are an archive and much of our focus is on the informational content in our records, we place less importance on the aesthetic value of our collection. And as a result, we do not supply missing information and losses. And that's because it can't always be verified and the damage itself may be contextual information valuable to a researcher. This is in contrast to some museums and art galleries that want their items to look exactly how the artist intended it to be seen, sometimes resulting in extensive treatment and distinct aesthetic differences. Exceptions have been made here in the past, as in the case of this DeKalb County map from 1869. Previous conservation treatment included a metal insert here to replace, a missing, uh, to replace missing plat information, but the paper was acidic. Reformatting staff scanned and printed this section of the map onto conservation grade paper and it was replaced. You can see that a little bit easier on this uh, with this dark back background here. So one thing to keep in mind is that our records came from state agencies that may or may not have expected some of these, rec these records to be kept in perpetuity. Also, these records were physically handled in the course of someone's job and preserving evidence of that use is sometimes just as important as the written information. As I keep mentioning, the ultimate point of interventive conservation efforts here is to stabilize collection items, not only for safe use by patrons and staff, but also to prolong the life of the items. Treatments for reference materials, which are used more frequently and aren't rare or original, make, may more closely resemble restoration. And that's because extra care and harder, hardier materials are needed to ensure sustained use by patrons. For example, this is a book from our reference library that needed a new spine label. The damage occurred as a result of taking the original label off. The damage didn't affect the function of the book, but we wanted to stabilize the cover from further damage without being distracted, distracting. So jam, Japanese tissue paper was toned to match the rest of the book and a heavier adhesive used in the repair. As I said earlier, exhibited items will also go through more treatment to prepare for being on display for months at a time. One such example is this whipping report record covering the years 1914 to 1922, which yes, is exactly what it sounds like. When convicts leased out to private companies disobeyed, they would be punished. Before donation to the archives by a private individual, duct tape was used to keep the detached cover with the rest of the book. 
This being an original item and not a published book, it required more special handling than a volume from the reference collection. The adhesive residue from the tape was reduced and a new spine created from toned Japanese tissue paper. While we didn't want the repair to be distracting, we also didn't want to pass the treatment off as original to the item in order to preserve its integrity, hence the near color matching. Now that we've gone over treatment methodology, let's go over some of the other standard treatments we do here at the archives. None, some, or all of these treatments could be used on an item. As I keep saying, it just depends on its original state and what the desired outcome is. I'll also say that before we begin treatment, we come up with a treatment plan based on an examination of the item. And that includes testing the media for solubility in water or any other solvents we suspect we may need to use for treatment. If we find that, for example, a particular ink is going to run on a map when exposed to water, then we find ways around using water during the treatment. Oftentimes, the materials an item has been backed with in the past aren't currently conservation approved. Take this map, for example. The fabric is of unknown content, likely treated with chemicals, and is filled with dirt it picked up throughout its life. And the result, you can see that there. Um, also, the adhesive used to attach the backing to the map was likely an animal-based glue, which is its own concoction of gross chemicals, and likely contributed to this paper yellowing. A fabric backing like this also works at odds with the paper substrate when environmental conditions change, so that the fabric, uh, fabric would shrink when exposed to moisture or high humidity, but the paper would expand, further putting the paper at risk for tears. Washing is how we remove water-soluble acidity, as well as some stains and adhesive after backing removals, such as with the previous map. As this map floats on the water surface, uh, capillary action pulls impurities into the water through its back. Lining is often necessary after a backing removal to provide structural support to the map itself. Here you can see me helping conservator Sigourney Smuts lay down Japanese tissue paper saturated with wheat starch paste over the back of a large map. She is brushing out any air bubbles to ensure there is good contact between the tissue paper and the map. We are very glad to have the support of the R.J. Taylor Jr. Foundation, which funds the work I do on this particular project of humidifying and flattening Hancock County Superior Court records from the late 18th century through the early 20th century. This type of treatment is necessary when items are folded, creased, or just generally not quite flat, which threatens their safety and accessibility. As you can see on the picture, in the picture on the far left, the records came to the archives folded and tied up in packets. Before a researcher can safely access them, they must be humidified in the humidity chamber, this, this guy here, where they are individually numbered to maintain original order and left in long enough to become pliable to safely unfold. At that point, the documents are removed from the chamber and put under weight between materials designed to soak up the excess moisture without sticking to anything. The next day, they are taken out from underweight and placed in folders for processing. Once processed, they are safe for researchers to handle. Tape is the bane of probably every, con every conservator's existence. If you look closely at both sides of this document, you can see how the tape is placed along the folds to prevent them from fracturing any further than they already had. And that is here, some here, I think there's some here, and along the front there. So the problem with that is that tape breaks down and does some really funky stuff. In this case, it discolored the paper as well as distorted and pulled the document in different ways, putting the paper at risk for further damage. After trying a few solvents to see what would soften the adhesive most effectively, I settled on water. Brushing a small amount along the tape, I used a scalpel to ensure I wasn't skinning the paper, seen here under a microscope, and the result was this beaker full of tape carrier known all that summer as the beaker of shame, and it served as a good example of what not to do. So please, if you care anything about your personal collections, don't use tape on them. It can be, um, it can cause a huge amount of damage and be difficult to remove successfully, even by trained professionals. If you already have tape on your treasured items, I suggest you seek out a qualified conservator for treatment. And we'll go over that um, a little more in a few slides. And here's what the document looked like after repairs with Japanese tissue. 
So the tissue uh, is here on these lighter areas. And so it's a little more um, invisible than the tape was. And it may not look much different, but it is stabilized and ready to be used by researchers or go on display as was the case with this document. Sometimes items have rips or holes that need to be addressed so further damage isn't incurred. To do this, we have several options of adhesives and mending tissues to use, and the combination depends entirely upon the object, object being treated. These records came to the archives arranged neatly in a box, but were so packed in that some sheets were damaged. These thin papers only required a bit of flattening and a thin tissue to be put back together. Some items may have come to the archives with mold damage. The conditions in our vaults are not optimal for mold growth, so it's been rendered inactive while with us. However, if somehow reintroduced to optimal conditions, mold can rehydrate and be as much as a hazard uh, as much a hazard as before vault and conditions. To prevent this from happening, the spores are removed for the health of our staff and patrons. We do this using a HEPA filter vacuum and micro attachments and a variable speed motor to prevent inadvertent damage to objects and do this in our fume hood, which gently sucks up loose spores and passes them through filters before being vented outside the building. If we suspect live mold, we will dehydrate it by gently dabbing isopropanol on the, on the item, which is what I'm doing here. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the damage caused by mold isn't reversible, and you can see here that there's some staining that remained even after the treatment. Now for a bit of fun. There is a reason why conservators and other preservation professionals sometimes cringe at the term restoration and why we follow a code of ethics. The term restoration often conjures images of treatments gone too far or hor horribly wrong because the practitioner didn't know his or her limits or didn't respect the history of the item being treated. Here are some extreme examples of restoration gone wrong. Here is a castle in Turkey that the local government decided to restore. Despite being called an architectural ode to SpongeBob SquarePants, the government somehow still defends the restoration. Here's one from China done by well-meaning villagers. The county government didn't know the painting was being done until after it was completed. And as a result, their administration of cultural heritage improved the management and protection of other cultural works in the county to prevent the same from happening elsewhere. The one I think most people are familiar with is the Eke Homo fresco here, or what has affectionately been called Beast Jesus and Monkey Christ. This restoration was completed in 2012 by an untrained parishioner of the church where the fresco lives, and she clearly didn't recognize her own limits. Next, we have the potato head of Palencia, restored last year and ridiculed all over social media. So much so that no one has confessed to either the commissioning of the work or the uh, completing the work itself. The Canadian statue of Mary and Baby Jesus here uh, <clears throat> has an interesting twist to its story. The victim of vandalism, oh, it's, it's dying again. Well, the victim of vandalism in 2015, the head of baby Jesus was stolen and a replacement attempted by another well-meaning untrained parishioner. The restoration compared to the likeness of Maggie Simpson was so bad that the vandals eventually returned the head. And then the Mary and baby Jesus on the right was restored using these neon paints. Clearly those paints aren't gonna be conservation grade um, and gonna be pretty difficult to remove uh, not to mention not historically accurate to when the, the, uh, the item was created. So there are so many more than this, so many more than there should be. So feel free to Google restoration fails to see more. One good thing to have come out of these failed attempts, however, is that many people in the areas where these treatments happened have a greater appreciation for the field and have called for greater emphasis on conservation training being necessary to work on cultural treasures. Now that you can see, or now that you've seen what can go wrong, I'm sure you now understand how important the conservation code of ethics is to collections care. I've provided the links here for you to find a conservator in your area, both from the American Institute for Conservation and the Southeast Regional Conservation Association. If you want to ensure your treasures will be treated with longevity and integrity in mind, 
make sure to choose a con conservator who specializes in the, in the material of your item, whether that's an object, painting, book, paper, or whatever else. They will know how best to treat your specific item and give you the ethical options for treatment. Thank you very much for spending your valuable time with me here today. And special thanks to Archives Conservator Sigourney Smuts for letting me borrow some of the information from her preventive conservation workshop. And I guess at this point I will take questions. Do we have any questions? What is your favorite type of treatment to do? Ooh, type of treatment. Hmm. I like it. Well, there are easy ways to get around it to prevent this from happening, but I like it when a map comes apart and it's basically a huge jigsaw puzzle um, because I like puzzles. They're really fun. You have any other questions? No questions? We still have. Ooh, I finished early. 19 minutes. Any other questions? Just a minute, see if anybody has okay, well, we're, we're going to hang out for you guys. You might have any questions. What advice would you give to people looking after their own collections at home, which the best practice for them to use in looking after their treasures? Best practice. Well, um, use <clears throat> preservation grade materials. So that's going to be lignin free, acid free, um, buffered pH neutral, any of those, um, any, any kind of materials like folders, have documents in folders, um, make sure items aren't exposed to um, too much light, um, <clears throat> specifically UV light from outside. Um, let's see, Environmental conditions. I know what we do here is way too strict for most people, uh, which is 68. Well, actually in the vaults, it's about 60 degrees and. Uh, let's see, 35 to 40 percent relative humidity. Um, I know that's not really sustainable for most people. Um, I guess that's about it. Anything else? Nobody has any questions. I guess I explained things so thoroughly. No one has any questions. Well, thank <laughs> you, Tracy, for this very informative presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that people really enjoyed listening to you speak. And again, if you didn't have the chance to view it live or you'd like to share this presentation with somebody else, it will be on our YouTube channel next week. If you'd like to learn more information about conservation, the archives have two upcoming workshops on paintings conservation and archival mounting later this year. More information can be found on our website, georgiaarchives.org. We also have some upcoming events you may be interested in. On Saturday, June 5th, the Georgia Genealogical Society is offering a free virtual picnic with the Georgia Archives with the theme, the 1950s US Census, are you ready? To register for the seminar, please go to the GGS website. Our next virtual. We do have, we do have a question. Oh, I will oh. hand back over to oh, Tracy. Oh, OK. Uh, what are the best ways to conserve plastics? Plastics. Oh, plastics are not my specialty. Um, do you have any? Hmm. The difficulty of preserving plastics. Again, uh, I would say you want to be more mindful of the environment that you're storing them in. So you want to avoid having them under harsh lighting. Uh, specifically, as Tracy said, UV light is especially damaging. You can get UV light from all sorts of lighting, not just outdoor lighting. And the best would be if you could store them in spaces that had LED lighting. Uh, you also want to be mindful of high temperatures and humidity. So you always want to make sure that your humidity is below 50% relative humidity and try to keep your temperature below 70 degrees. Otherwise, as Tracy had the slide, you can contact a professional conservator who specializes in plastics and they can be found on the AIC website under Find a Conservator. And Circa. 
and CIRCA, which is the Southeast Regional Conservation Association. Mm -hmm. This is from Joy Allen. Okay. Conservation workshops in the future, which you answered. Oh, and we happen to be, this is one that um, Circa has sponsored, but we are actually set up for a workshop happening next week um, on um, ways of testing, spot testing materials to determine what they're made of. So we can, um, the instructor is going to speak about how to test to determine whether something has salt content, protein content, things like that. And that's going to help to um, determine how we uh, proceed with treatment. And as we said earlier, we do have an annual workshop series. We have had two of the workshops already this year, and we'll be having one in September on introduction to painting conservation, and another one in November on how to archivally mount your items to prevent them being damaged in the future. And we'll be continuing with this uh, annual training next year with a whole new set of workshops. Mm -hmm. So please keep an eye on our Facebook page as well as our website. All right. Uh, what was your favorite <clears throat> project so far? So, would you like to repeat the question? Oh, my, my favorite project so far. Um, oh, wow. That's. That is a really good one. I think I have to go back to the maps. The maps are my favorite, um, which are between the um, between the Hancock County court records and maps. Those are the, the main two things that I work on. Um, maps are just there's there. It's kind of like a combination of art and puzzle <laughs> because they're so beautiful. And, and most of the ones that I work on are hand drawn. So they're very intricate and interesting. Um, so I can I can sometimes kind of get lost in the details, and um, I love I love being able to make that connection with an item. I think that answers it. Any further questions for Tracy? Last chance. Last chance. If you have any questions in the future regarding anything re related to conservation or preservation, you are more than welcome to contact Tracy or myself. Mm -hmm. So Tracy will tracy.johnson at usg.edu mm -hmm. and I am sigourney.smuts at usg.edu. Mm -hmm. And we are a resource for anyone in Georgia or the Southeast. Mm -hmm. Shall I continue with my standard? <laughs> <laughs> Our next virtual lunch and learn will, uh, program is scheduled for Friday the 11th of June and this will be at noon again and it will be the topic of D-Day plus six days with Mr. Bill Clements. The link to join the program will be posted on the Georgia Archives website and also on our Facebook page. We'd like to thank you all for joining us and again this will be up on YouTube and please follow us on Facebook. Thank you.